the VS the cast is Lisa. News is is the uh, news for, for you and me. The Melody Show. The VS cast is news. Because we are the VS casters and we love to bring you BS and it's only the best BS that you'll ever hear. The VS cast is news. Because we are the VS casters and we love to bring you BS and it's only the best BS that you'll ever hear. And then let's try it again. Welcome. Oh. Welcome to the BS Casters News Show. I'm Melody. And I'm Tessa. And we are, we are the, the BS, BS Casters, Casters bringing you news, the best, the best most, most accurate, accurate news, news in the, in the BS, BS world. <laughs> we like started to slow mo, like <laughs> to our words. <laughs> Welcome to episode one of our HI History series. So this first chapter of the Young and Heart Harmony's 50th anniversary yearbook. Yes, Young and Heart yearbook. Um, so we're going to cover chapter one today and chapter two. So chapter one is called Pre Prelude. Is that the musical way to say it? Prelude? I think Prelude. so. Prelude. Prelude to Harmony. Oh, I just got it. That's like a musical term, but also not. It's fine. So chapter one, Prelude to Harmony 1957. Great. Okay. So let's take you back. Imagine yourself in 1957. Not a great time, but let's do it anyway. So only Sweet Adelines Incorporated, they were incorporated at that time. They were not Sweet Adelines International. That was not their name. Sweet Adelines Incorporated were the only female barbershop organization around town, all the towns, in 1957. Sweet Ads was founded in 1948, just for your own like personal information. So prior to 1957's International Convention, which was held in Miami, there was a lot of not great things happening. There was a lot of unrest among the members of, of Sweet Adelines over particularly certain international policies and procedures. So just know it wasn't, there were some rough waves in the water. They were stirring, the pot was boiling. So to talk, so going back, what some of the issues were, you had regions were starting to get real big and they were setting up their own governmental structures and they were starting chorus competitions, which were not a thing at the international level. That's an important note. So at the time regions were like, we're gonna have our own government systems. We're gonna start chorus competitions. And because of the chorus competitions, the attendance of regional meetings went way up. <clears throat> and so, um, because a lot of people wanted to compete and there wasn't a thing to do at international, so they all attended regional in order to participate in such activity, right? So then there were large regions had several meetings throughout the year and the meetings from what I can tell are like quasi conventions is like meetings to me sounds very like sitting around in a room, but I, when they say meetings, they mean like get togethers, gatherings. So like large reg regions were having several gatherings a year. They sponsored their own craft classes, which like, I want to know what, what a craft class is. <laughs> Why aren't we doing that now? And what right? does that mean? <laughs> craft classes and they collected regional dues. So probably to put on these craft classes and such. Um, so this, all this regional hubbub was upsetting the head honchos at international, like the international level, because they thought that if everyone was coming to these regional events, that they'd stop coming to the international events. Like their incentive would be gone, which is like an interesting concept, but I think that's silly. <laughs> right, and I guess it was, it was more because like they were having those course based things at regional events. And like you said, because people wanted to be in a chorus. So like if there wasn't that opportunity at international, then and that was what you wanted to do. If you weren't trying to sing in the quartet, then like, why would I go to international? It's interesting because like in 1957, it said the the SAI board thought entire courses would never attend an international competition. Um, yes. So I, I have like, just, yeah. I just double checked to see when like SBBS USA's first course one was to see like relatively how that works. But like they had their first course invitational in 1953, which was like, you were invited to sing. It wasn't really like a competition. And then the following, all the years after that, SPBX USA was having chorus competitions. So it was just like interesting that the SAI board didn't think that would ever happen. So that was their like stance according to the history. Right, right, right. Um, and that also, it's interesting to me because what it sounds like is that they didn't think like enough chorus members would show up to compete. Like that's kind of how I interpret it. But then I don't know the rule. Is there a rule currently? Like 
what stops in a 100 member chorus only competing with 20 members at international like is that allowed or not allowed because to me i never there isn't there hasn't ever been like a, a cap or a, a low minimum i feel like i don't know maybe there it's is but i think the low end is 12. okay so but like so if they i guess were, it depends but right you have to re you have to register like the number of people that are planning on competing so like that shouldn't have even right. been an issue Right. I think it's interesting because like they're saying they don't think entire courses were come, but I don't, I would be, I don't think that happens today. Like <laughs> in many uh, entire, right, your full like, course does not go probably yeah. almost every time. Yeah. So I was like wondering if there was maybe like a percentage or something, but it just seems silly that it, that was like where they went. They're like, oh, well, there won't be any attendance. And you're like, well, I don't think full courses yeah. compete now. But yes, that, that was a major thing. So all this time, regions and membership as a whole were, were not loving the minimized uh, participation and input that regions were getting towards the international level. Um, they, they had these things called regents, which sound very royal, and they were the highest elected officials of the region. So I guess now they'd be called regional directors. I don't know what their official title is at this moment, but yeah, I guess region regions have been through a couple of different models since then. So I think that that whole uh, thing has changed anyway, because they have the RMT now where there's right. uh, different types of leaders and they try to call it something different for the pilot program. And I think there was something different before that. Yeah. They have like, they have leaders. They're just always, they've been called different things. Right. The time. So regents is fun because regents sounds real royal. Um, and a lot of, members that were against regions having not a lot of control, they were met with this, the, the definition of regions. So the international board would tell them, well, regents means one who governs in the absence of a higher authority. In this case, the international board, but there is an international board. So there's, they were basically saying, so you have no reason to govern is basically what they were saying. Um, They're throwing some slight shade and people did not like that. They, um, they, instead of having the regents do what the international board says, a lot of people wanted the reverse where international would do what the regents said because the regents who were, were elected by local membership. So it was, they were like the grassroots people and the voices of the people. And they felt that they were not being heard enough at the international level, which like valid concern that's still happening in a lot of organizations today. Um, so let me find where I am. Oh, I was saying, I think that's interesting because it's very much like state, local government versus federal government. Mm -hmm. Like we yeah. just like, can't get over that. <laughs> in this country, it's just very much like perpetually always an issue. Yeah. <laughs> just like in organizations. The, in the, the, the intentions are good. It's just like no matter what we do it seems to be a system where people feel like they're not being represented properly yeah yep yep, yep. so then that was like controversy one-ish regions and international power collides happening then another moment of controversy was over the nomination process for international board so every outgoing international board at the time was nominated or um the every incoming board was nominated by the outgoing board so this, the people that were on the board nominated people that were coming into the board. Therefore, it was very like self-perpetuating, which- So I'll come back to some more information on that uh, later after we go through a little <coughs> bit more of what actually happened. But like, um, that's like existed and not existed in all three of our organizations over the last, like since SCBS USA was founded. And um, dad said it's called the, he thinks it's called the Carver model. So like the- goal of it might have said it seems really sketchy because then like nobody else gets to have any input but the goal of it is that or the pro of it is that like the board who's the people who are not outgoing on the board know that the people they work with are going to choose somebody else that they would like to work with which like is the point i guess but it still yeah. doesn't like represent <laughs> your um membership yeah it seems like it stunts a lot of growth in yeah. as far as organization organization goes because you would think like-minded people pick like mind you know people pick like-minded people to themselves so you're not really getting fresh input or you know new blood on on the board with that idea um which makes like i i can see the pro that you said 
um, but it does. It just doesn't make your membership feel like they're being heard. At yeah, all, yeah, and and I feel like that's still an issue among all the organizations, at least B SAI and BHS. Um, yes. So I'll go into a little more detail about this later, but foreshadowing that used to be SAI's thing. They don't do that anymore. We vote on like we nominate. There's a process where we nominate the people to be on the board and then vote on them. DHS right now, I'm not trying to throw shade in any organization's direction when I say this, but DHS right now has the Carver model. Gotcha. They have yes. the, which I was not aware of because I guess I wasn't paying attention enough to like who's always on the board and stuff, but DHS has the policy according to that right now that the current board chooses the people to replace them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, by and by, like, regions just wanted their regions to have a more active role because the regions they felt were pre representing them appropriately and accurately, and they felt detached from the international board. You know, there's this, like, disjointed membership down here, board up here. Um, so that was, like, controversy number two. Then we're on to controversy number three. So, I don't know what I held up. Mm. Number three. <laughs> number three. That was, like, six question mark. <laughs> So this one had to do with the chorus competitions, and we pretty much covered this, but regions were holding successful chorus competitions, which are awesome. And, and the ones that were holding successful chorus competitions wanted to have them at the international level, which makes sense. If you're successfully doing it, bring it to the top. That makes total sense. The official position was that there could be no international competition um, of choruses until the regions were equally developed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a terrible idea. I mean, that that makes sense to me. I mean, like it makes if you, sense. Just like, what does that mean? Like, right. what is yes. equally developed? What is what is your measurement of that? True, because you could also say current regions are not equally developed. Still, I mean, size, number of courses in the area, number of resources, money. There's a lot of you know. I'd be interested. I don't know that you could say they're equally developed currently, but the idea that you'd want, like. The regions to be developed enough to have chorus competitions is like that makes sense to me you yeah. know um but again how do you enforce that slash like size that up and what happens when a new region is born like do you just wait you know there's just a lot of like conditions that that would make it hard to to meet and but we yeah. talked about the like under the table reason is that sai just thought no one would show up and we've talked about that that's an interesting moment um, <clears throat> so, great. So all these controversies, like peak, peak 1957 uh, convention, this is like, they all came to like culminate at the 1957 convention in Miami. So, hold on, my computer is being weird. Are you sure you want to update? No. Okay, so, peak upset, 1957. Um, at the Miami convention, the regents met to draw up demands. So that they could ship them off the board and just be like, hey, fellas, these are our issues right now. Well, the international board heard that this was happening and they crashed the party. They sent their own chairwoman to facilitate the meeting and the regents were like, nah, it's okay. We have our own. And the international board was like, no, 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 I got it. And then the regents are like, oh no. But apparently the chairwoman did her job, like the demands went on paper and they were sent to the international board. So they like, she did, you know, what she needed to do, but they were not too pleased with that. <clears throat> and so uh, based off of this yearbook, I heard that the Miami convention was popping. It was one of the best, it says. Um, however, this meeting of the regions was the most popular and historic event at the thing by like eons. Some regions sent members to the convention solely to be a part of this meeting, to witness it, like to do nothing else. Um, and so that was a big darn deal. Um, some, there are two people I'm going to mention um, that went to this meeting and they're, they're come in way, they'll come in shortly, but there's a nice lady called Joan Stockwell. She's Joan Chapman now from, oh, I want to look up how to say this. Look up how to say Oria, Ontario. O R I L L I A. How do you say that? O Wait. O R I L L I A. Yeah. O R I L L I A. This video is a minute long for how to pronounce this word. <laughs> oh. 
Aurelia. Aurelia. All right, so back at it. Joan Stockwell, Joan Chapman now, was from Aurelia, Ontario. All right, she was, she was one of the peeps that showed up to this meeting. She would later become a Harmony Inc. founder, but like we're not there yet. Um, and she and Ruth Giles, who was one of the authors of this book, is that what we just said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, great. Um, uh, she was the regent of region three. So they were best pallies. They like had a lot of similar feelings. They went to the meeting together. They're great. So we'll talk about them later. Um, and so then I think it was Giles, right? I spelled it weirdly, but I think I just misspelled it. G-I-L-E-S, no, G-E-I-L-S, but yeah. I think it is pronounced Giles. Okay, okay, I think it's right. Okay, cool, great, perfect. They're on their way, they're at their meeting, love it. So we'll get back to them. So um, at this convention, this meeting, no one expected this little big butted bomb to basically be dropped. Some, someone, we have no freaking clue who, or some people, calmly suggested that the corporate bylaws be amended to make membership available to only women of Caucasian race. Ew. So, so then the meeting exploded, as you can probably think happened. I like to imagine that like someone off the street walked in and like was witnessing this and was like, what can I do to like mess with people right like it was like, a random person yeah. it wasn't like and from the back someone's like caucasians oh my and then like ran like <laughs> i would just like to know who does that just that to yeah. me that's how i picture it because no one knows what the heck happened but the meeting exploded so, i thought it was interesting that like i didn't i didn't know until reading this that um that that wasn't a law beforehand like to my in my mind when sai was founded that, that was, was like already part of the rules. It was, it was not. There just no. were, there didn't happen to be any members of color at that time. Yes. Um, yep. It just, it just wasn't a rule yet. I never knew that information. True. Um, and uh, ironically, because Miami is where the convention was held, there were a lot of members present from the Deep South because it was so close. So you can imagine this meeting, all of a sudden, a lot of women were like, yeah, on board. Blah. In 1957, um, yeah. yeah. So a lot of other members, though, were appalled. They mentioned specifically the Canadians were appalled, and I think that's funny because I always said that Canada's fake and they just exist in an alternate reality where everything's fine. And I still believe, <laughs> I still believe that. <laughs> we got to find some I've dirt on Canada. I've never been more certain of that than I was at the time of reading this book. It's like so your girlfriend, like she's too good to be true. That's like how Canada is. I just like need to find some <laughs> about Canada. <laughs> but yeah, but Canada's, we're, Canadians are like, nah, this seems wrong. So it basically split the membership into two, which like we should be very familiar with divisive organization at the moment. So <laughs> this should feel normal. Everyone hate each other, makes sense. So no one, uh, so yeah, just like Mel said, that at that time, there were no black members and, and sweet ads, um, but there was no policy previously. Um, important fact is that after this policy was suggested, there was no poll of membership that was taken to see what the entire, what members felt on the subject. That was not a thing that happened. Um, it was just brought to the head honchos and they dealt with it. Um, people went into action to oppose the policy and they worked their butts off to make it known that they hated it. Members quit quietly or like not so quietly. There was a regent that resigned, chapters split open, mass chaos, almost 2020 style. You know, that is. Almost. Almost. So here's some cue some sad music, like little baby violins. <laughs> like I feel like Titanic music's playing. So as... Yeah. <laughs> so... Formal announcement, the policy was adopted. Right. So um, they warned, SAI warned, um, I being ink at this time, SAI warned that there would be no further discussion, verbal or written, about the subject. They basically were like, we adopted it in a discussion. Mom and dad are leaving. Um, and to what you were saying earlier, so any protest or requests for referendum were met with the, the sentence, the phrase, that Sweet Ad Alliance had an unwritten policy this whole time, and that time had come to just avoid future problems by putting it into the bylaws. 
which is gross, <laughs> but that's what they said. So they basically yeah, accepted that it weird. wasn't a thing, but then we're like, no, it was the whole time, but we just want to write it down for you. Okay. So that was gross. And that's how it was happening. So, um, members are basically told to accept it and sing or leave. Um, and so, yes, I, I have a rant. Great. I'm ready. So I, after reading all this, I was like, as we know, as we very much know now, like currently, if you don't actively try to diversify your art form, like fully reach out and engage um, in the communities that are different, um, they won't like just come knocking. That's just not a, I mean, I feel like that's very much apparent in barbershop now. Like we keep talking about this, like, how do we diversify barbershop? And we're making strides, but right. you can't just expect people of color to just like happen upon it and like walk to the door if it you know like if if you're not actively trying to engage their community yeah like it's definitely just, not from not from two organizations that like from the beginning like did not allow BIPOC to join like right there's just no <laughs> right and so, like why what's the incentive even if right. you, even if you're allowed now why would you want to join an organization even if you're like maybe they're different like because what if they're not right yes and so like that was that's like a big thing plus like civil rights movement was like hella full swing and there were some like other important things happening right at this moment in time so to me i think it's funny that they i, I think it's interesting that they, they make a point to say that there were no black members at the time but like putting those two things in perspective, like they had other, th other, <laughs> they had other things going on that they were not focusing on barbershop at the moment. Um, I would be interested though. I like have a random question. I'd be interested to know across all organizations if there are active members of either three barbershop organizations that are in the United States that were that also participated in the civil rights movement, or if they had family that did. I just think I just want to know. I think that's interesting. I just like I would also be curious because like you'd probably be really young if you were still kicking right now which like superhero you <laughs> but but yeah I just think it's interesting so tell us if you were I think it's really awesome so that about rants over it's done so <laughs> um people tried to fight it obviously um and sketchily again miss big sister sketch international board sent like spies down to regional meetings to basically identify the troublemakers which is like Right, that was the word used too in the book. Troublemakers. That yeah. sounds weird. Yep, bad. All bad news. <laughs> Sketchy as. Yeah. So, then this other sketch. We're on the sketch train. Uh, S A I. We're on a sketch train. So on a sketch train. <laughs> if if the majority of a chorus wanted to give up their charter and go independent um, because they disagree with the policy members that disagreed with that action or rather agreed with the new policy were granted special privileges so they were able to maintain their charters and were given time and help to rebuild which means on paper there were very few loss of chapters during this time which basically means that data is very skewed it's it almost sounds like a cover-up <laughs> Um, but so like a lot of chapters that would have just disbanded because many of the members wanted out because of the policy didn't because they were just like given the extra push to like keep going. So on paper, it looks like blink. Blink. Oh, okay. It looked like you were frozen. <laughs> oh. You didn't blink for a minute. So um, on paper, it just seems like this policy didn't necessarily do any harm when really it did kind of thing. It covers up how tumultuous, you know, how affected the membership was. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so people are mad. Everyone's quitting. Quartets are like fighting in the streets, you know, the huge. Um, but um, the like appeal to barbershop was too strong. Many members just like let it go. They were there to sing and not fight, which is like a weird thing that I feel like has been said over the past few days. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Many um, politics with barbershop. Yeah. You share? So many just decided to get in, to just like not ever get involved in the business aspect. They just figured they just like let that be and sing. 
so I think it's interesting because they, they put aside their beliefs or values to sing, which is interesting. Well, if it didn't affect them directly enough right. for it to matter, that's right. like a lot of what we're experiencing now. Yeah. So few, few, very few of those who left um, basically summoned the courage to start over. Um, they loved barbershop a lot and they wanted to prove that good music can coexist with good government. Um, and this was a very hard vision to have because they basically had to create an international organization in a field that already had an international organization. Bonkers. So yeah, the end chapter one, boom, 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 boom. boom. So this like policy will really, the sentence of like, you can accept it and sing or you can leave, like upsets me. I think that makes my, my heart hurt. Cause like, I'm forever proud of like SAI for acknowledging that this was a mistake and a huge blemish on their history. Um, however, I do still think the like gravity of the situation isn't talked about enough. Um, I think it's a difficult thing to apologize for and move on just in general. Um, and I'm sure it's a tough to topic like in among SII head honchos currently like I, but, but this sucked like this was a bad move. Um, and, and it's, and it was all, almost an unforgivable action, right? I mean, like we were talking about how, why would anyone want to join if that was their history? Um, but I think that if SEI keeps doing more of this amazing work, like we're seeing like in the past few weeks where, you know, they're making strides among the current like Black Lives Matter movement. Like, I think if we keep that up, that's a good uh, trajectory, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like also the next step is to make sure that members of our organization or our organization being SAI at this moment, members of SAI, particularly those that are like seen as the faces of, or, of the organization, anyone in power or anyone that's seen as like representative, any of those people that proudly express racist rhetoric be removed from their positions. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything that you remove racist songs from your repertoire if you have judges and other international members that don't believe that. They're against they're, that vocally, yeah. Right, I just think that doesn't, that, that almost counteracts any good you do. You know, like you, ha you have to clean house if you wanna expand the house. You know, like you can't, you can't just, it, it's, it's part of the like following through. You know, like they did step one, but they have to do step two in, in order for the action yeah. to be complete. I just think it's, it's just an interesting, because I'm really proud of the direction they're going, but I do think some important things have to keep happening in order for there to be, uh, it to be more positive, I think is what. Yeah. Would... Yeah. I think a lot of that is, it, I guess I want to say it can't happen all at once. It could. I just think the risk is like further dividing the organization and losing a lot of membership. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what how I don't know how you don't do that, but like making strides a chunk at a time maybe would do that less. But also, I don't know anything. So. Right, we know nothing. We know nothing. Cool. So that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two: A New Beginning, 1958. <laughs> I feel like. Like the should like like SpongeBob like two years later like <laughs> oh I was like I was going towards Star Wars I was, what is I was like what is episode two called is that Clone Wars I don't know even though I watched them all Attack of the Clones that's what it is or like I think Wars it was on the show and or game I I think it was on two Attack of the Clones <laughs> <laughs> I think it was on Arthur that would be like chat chapter two it was like a scary thing <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's like a thing that's ingrained into my childhood memories anyway all right so brush it off that was a rough start chap like whew, there's a lot of shindigs happening that are no, no it just goes right into the like no boy no <laughs> i know first of all i mentioned a little bit about this but just to go a little bit more specifically and kind of give you a direct comparison to the like three organizations that we've been discussing um Ask mom and dad about the um, like board structures. Um, dad said a few decades ago, SCBS QSA, um, each district would choose someone to be on the international board, and each district had one representative on the board. At some point, it was decided there were too many board members, and districts paired up and then had one board member between the two of them that was chosen by the chosen by the district. Um, and he thinks they they alternated every term with like which district they came from, so it still felt okay. like they were 
that everybody was represented, um, but there weren't too many members on the board. Um, at some point, that changed to what we have now, which he thinks is called the Carver model, where the board elects their own replacement. So VHS members have no input into who's on the board. Um, when SAI was founded, the board used what he called the Carver model, um, where the board is choosing their um, their next uh, representative, or yeah, their replacement. Um, at some point, it changed to what we have now. I don't know when it changed. At some point, it changed to what we have now, which is basically where um, members elect the board of directors. Mom says there's a committee that looks at the board applications and vets those based on their applications and comes up with the candidates. Then the resumes are posted um, in each course votes within their course based on the resumes. Um, and then we've already talked about now HI members nominate and vote on who represents them on the board. And Katie said that like specific manner is changing, but the basics are going to stay the same is that HI members still nominate and they still vote on their representatives. Yes. Which means, again, not to throw any shade in any one direction, but that means <clears throat> that right now, DHS is about, to, is the only organization that the board chooses their replacement. Yeah. Um, so, whatever. Um, <laughs> Do with that much. <laughs> yeah, I did want to, wait, this reminded me, I wanted to, to thank Katie, because she's the one that gave me this, gave me the link to this book. I asked about HI history, and she, like, gave me all the things, and she's amazing, so... Thank you, Katie Taylor, for just Thank like, you, Katie. being yourself. Okay, great. Continue. <laughs> that was a plug. Perfect of all angels. Yes. Um, so, yeah, just I was kind of trying to put together the timeline of all of the events that we've talked about um, and just like a couple of other ones that, were, that I wanted to kind of tack on the end. So, just for your putting all of these things into like time perspective, even though time is an illusion, 1938. SCBSQA is founded. 39 is the first, I'm going to say Fred Scusa now. 39 is the first Fred Scusa Quartet Contest. Um, there are, I think in this book, um, it says 48 was when SAI was founded. There's other sources that say 45, so I'm not really sure where the um, disconnect is, but it's somewhere I found it said 45 SAI was founded. 47 was the first SAI Quartet Contest. 53 was the first Fred Scusa Chorus contest, and that one was really the invitational that, and then all the years after that, they had a contest. Um, 57 was when SAI, like, revealed that, that they weren't going to allow black singers, and there had been a part Good of word. bylaws, just unspoken. And then 59, um, foreshadowing, was when HI was founded. I think 61 is the first HI Chorus competition. Um, 63 yeah. is, the, is um, when Seb Skusa announced that they were going to allow black members. 64, I think, oh wait, I think I did that backwards. Um, 61 was the first HI quartet competition, maybe, and then 64 was the first chorus competition. Okay. Um, 66, we'll get there. SAI um, decided to allow black members, and then in 73 was the first SAI chorus contest. So, so you said 66 I think it's was... like. 66 was when SAI allowed black members into the organization. Is that what you said? 66, yeah. And then 73, three years, it's three years after Subfusion. But yeah, after that was when they had their first chorus contest, according to so the like, history on their site and the score sheets and stuff. Yeah, and like also, HI was founded as a new organization, held a quartet and chorus competition before SAI decided to allow black members and before they had a chorus contest. I just never knew all of those things in the session. Yeah. I didn't know what the relationship was. That is so interesting to me. And I would love, if there are like SAI members who like are super old now, who like were at all involved in the like goings on during that time period, I would love to hear from like your perspective. Yeah. Because it just I wish like it took a long time. We need to do, I have this called like timeline.com, which I did when I was a history major. <clears throat> and we should put it on the internet. <laughs> we should, I should show it to you. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> um, so yeah, cool. Yeah, we'll get to yeah. that stuff for sure. All right. Timeline. Love it. Do -do 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 -do. Back to chapter two, a new beginning, 1958. Okay, so now put yourself back. July, 1958, all right? The Melody Bells, Melody Bells sounds really Southern, but they're from Providence, Rhode Island, so that's not the case. But they withdrew, <laughs> they withdrew from Sweet Outlines, Inc. 
followed by three other Massachusetts chapters, the Harborettes of Skituit, the Harmonettes of North Attleboro, and my personal favorite, the Sea Gals of New Bedford. I think that's great. That's close to Cracker Jills. Cracker Jills and Sea Gals, yeah. I'm all for. All right. So they, and then only one Canadian chapter withdrew initially, and they were the Harmony Bells of Aurelia, Ontario? Aurelia, yeah. Aurelia, Ontario, um, with our girl Joan. So 150 women from these chapters met at the Round Top Congressional Church in Providence to basically talk about the idea of starting a new organization based on democratic principles and open to all women, regardless of race, creed, or color. Boom. So some points they were very strongly, or they really wanted to make sure they incorporated these things. They believed that um, a more representative government was needed. They wanted to encourage their members to participate in all major decisions. They believed that like proper lines of communication between the members and those elected to govern must be like established and open all times. Is your mailman here? No, other weird stuff is happening, but I think it's fine. (laughs) Um, They wanted freedom of expression so that like if a member had a good idea or an idea, they could talk freely and gain like more members to support them. Um, And so that's great. There were three women in particular that stuck out of these five chapters. So they stuck out because they were super involved in SAI and then used their strengths, time, and energy to basically found this new organization, which is like baller. So first gal is Peggy Rigby. Eleanor Rigby. (laughs) Okay. So she had served, she'd served on the International Board of Sweet Ads like a baller and then became the first international president of HI. Wait, I'm going to show you her. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Share screen. Ooh. There's Peggy. Hey, girl. Look at her. Peggy. Peggy. She has curls. I know. Look at her. And she's wearing like a little hat. It's cute. All right. So stop share. Stop share. Okay, great. So we had Peggy. And then we had Joanne Willett who was the president of her chapter when it withdrew. Um, And she was the second international president of HI. Um, I think there's a picture of Joey. Hold on. Is this her? Yeah, this Joanne. Look at her. She looks like she's wearing a crown in this picture. Bomb glasses. Yeah, your mom has glasses like that. Yeah, she does. So here's Joanne. She's killing it. She's killing the game. Then we have um, our girl, Joan. We've talked about um, Joan Chapman Stockwell. She apparently was super popular in her area. Like she was um, like had garnered like crazy amount of publicity where she lived. So she was just like really good at PR apparently. Um, And she, uh, the three of them. So like Joanne, Joan and Peggy were all like introductory members to the board of directors, which is like, HI's big board. Um, So let's see if I can get some Joan action. There she is. Look at her. (laughs) She's so cute. So she served on the board. Also, they showed this picture of Ruth Kresge. I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce that. Wow. No idea. Um, And she was the third international president because you've got like 60 to 61. Oh, wait, no. 59 to 60. 60 to 61 with Joanne, and then 61 to 62 Mm -hmm. with Ruth. So that's that. Um, Fun fact about Peggy um, was that her husband, Murray, shout out to Murray, um, was actually the author of H.I.'s motto, which is a blend of, of, no, a blend with friendship. So like, he lived, I know, he just like excelled. He's the, he's the king. So yeah, so all of them jo- like were part of board directors. They were international president, they were founders, boom. And so that was basically like the start of the idea of HI being birthed. The end. Ta-da! Tune in next time uh, when we do chapter three, which is called The Struggle. 1959 to 1960. We hadn't already been struggling before this moment. This one is the struggle. (laughs) Oh, man. 
so yes, so this is our, our first studio of our HI history series. And we're excited to do more things and have maybe some special guests. Yeah, questions um, that you would like us to research or you have anything to add with, to what we've shared? I think we've thrown out some random questions um, mm -hmm. that we would like to know the answers to. So, you know, feel free to be a part of our, what did you say, informational journey. Yes, our informational learned journey. We're learning. Great. Cool. BS Custer's out.